Okay. My name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you so much for tuning into my podcast. I truly appreciate it. Uh, today's episode, it, it's, it's a good one. I think that about every episode, but this is a good one for, for a cool reason. You know, we have done episodes on the impact testosterone has on men's brain chemistry. And there's always been this suspicion and this, um, I don't know, what's a great word for it? Rumor, <laughs> let's say for lack of better terms, that testosterone will turn men into angry monsters running around and just like starting fires and fights and driving off, you know, cliffs and crazy stuff. And uh, does testosterone make you into a mean person or angry person? And in that podcast and in the studies, no, it doesn't. And there's reasons to that. And there's also things to discuss around that, why people would think such a thing. So we talked about it with men and that's a great episode. So then the question is now a good question asked that women have been asking me, what about women? And I kind of alluded to it in an earlier one, I think episode two or three of the podcast, I think is when I talked about it, but I'm going to get more into it now. So if you're a woman and your doctor prescribes you testosterone, what does it do? Does it turn you into a raging maniac? Does it make you fight? Does it make you angry? Will it turn you into this rude monster? No. And the literature on this is incredibly clear. No, it does not. Even in studies we can see, people given supra-physiological doses of testosterone do not turn into rage monsters. This is proven in the studies. This is seen clinically. This is the truth. So why? Why would we think that it does? And are there circumstances when you would see more anger when someone is taking testosterone? Is there an association anywhere? Which is a great question we will talk about. So I'm going to start off by saying, you know, in the literature and in my experience and in many doctors who do this, testosterone is what's called an anxiolytic, meaning it reduces anxiety. I have patients who cannot get on an airplane if their testosterone levels are below a certain point their anxiety is that severe. And you would think, oh, they're just saying that, but no, they're not. This is a true thing. And when someone's testosterone is low, it does have a direct impact on brain chemistry because testosterone is also a neurosteroid. It has impact on brain chemistry. So when you are taking testosterone, or if you're making enough naturally, testosterone crosses the blood-brain barrier, it gets turned into androstenediol, Androstenediol binds to your GABA receptors in your brain. The GABA receptor is the anxiety part of the brain. You quench anxiety with androstenediol. Not as good as allopregnenolone. Now, allopregnenolone, women get that through progesterone. So progesterone crosses the blood-brain barrier, turns into allopregnenolone. Allopregnenolone binds to the anxiety receptors, and that's why women who have adequate levels of progesterone have less anxiety. The same thing with testosterone. It's just not as strong, but it still works. It still binds to the anxiety receptors in the brain and lowers anxiety. The thing about it is that that's happening in the amygdala. The thing is perception of stress, perception of threat starts in the amygdala. That's the deeper part of the brain, the reptilian brain, they call it, whatever. Um, studies show that testosterone modulates the amygdala and the amygdala's response to stress. So angry faces in all these studies, people are given adequate levels of testosterone, either naturally or they, they're given to physiological levels, you know, from, from external sources, such as injectable. Um, angry faces seem less scary in their studies. They'll have these patients look at angry faces and they'll monitor their response to them. And they'll see that when someone has normal levels of testosterone, angry faces don't elicit fear as much as it does with people with lower testosterone. Also, when a person has low testosterone, they avoid anxiogenic parts of the environment. They avoid places in their lives that create anxiety. And adequate, not super physiological, we're talking normal levels of testosterone, they tend to explore anxious areas of their lives. In other words, it, testosterone reduces fear. It makes you more fearless in the face of stress. It makes you more fearless in the face of the things that used to provide you with anxiety. And there are thousands of studies. If you just pause this video now for this and you go to Google Scholar, 
Okay. Cause that's a research engine for studies. It's not like you're getting people's opinions on this. I want you to see the research itself and then go through the opinions on the research. It's a little bit cleaner that way. It's still, you know, you're looking through a lot of different research that could be one way or the other. Almost all the research on this is on this side saying what I'm about to say is that when you look up uh, testosterone and exploration of anxiogenic parts of the environment, anxiogenic is spelled A-N-X-I-O-G-E-N-I-C. Look that up. And you'll see study after study after study showing normal levels of testosterone improves your adaption to fear and your ability to address and to face things that would ordinarily cause you anxiety and fear. This is important. This is huge what I just said. And just keep that in the back of your head. So let me put this into a story. I'll have a patient, and I, this happened to me a long time ago, who, when we gave her testosterone at normal levels, within a few months, she called and says, you got to get me off of this. I'm a raving maniac. I'm causing trouble. I'm yelling at people. And I was like, what? And I looked at her labs we already had done. I was like, this shouldn't be happening. This doesn't happen. What's happening? So as a good doctor, I'm not going to immediately say, oh, it's testosterone. Get off of it. I asked her questions. What's happening? So... At the end of the day, she was in a hostile workplace with a boss who was verbally abusive. And what ended up happening is she stood up to him for the first time. She stood up for herself and she spoke her truth. And because of that, he yelled at her and she yelled back. And she stood her ground and spoke her mind and spoke her feelings. In the practice of medicine over the years, what I've learned is, is that when you're in a marriage and you're in a coupling and you're with someone in life, you know, I'll use myself as an example. When I first got married, and I've used this example before because it's a good one, I think. When I first got married, I was slightly feral. You know, I didn't really do dishes until I was ready to use a dish. And, and you know, that's just, I was feral. I'm not going to lie to you. My wife, <laughs> God bless her. Anyway, we first got married and, and, and she would say, you know, do your dishes. And hey, would you mind knocking out your dishes? So, oh yeah, of course, I'm terrible. I don't want to leave dishes for her. I love this person. I don't want to ruin this. No, I gotta, I'll do my dishes. I don't want her to feel, you know. So I go and do my dishes. And I do it for a little while. And then sooner or later, I drop off it again. And I just didn't do it. And then she would again say, hey, Brendan, dude, can you do your dishes? Oh yeah, sorry. Dang it, I just got to remember to do this. I do it again. But again, over time, kind of drop off. It got to the point where my wife doesn't want to be my parent. She doesn't want to be the person who um, tells me what to do. She doesn't want another kid. She wants a partner. This has a lot to do with testosterone, I promise you. Bear with me. After that, she just decided, screw it. I'm just going to do dishes myself and whatever. So every time I didn't do the dishes, I stepped over a boundary with her. And I expected her to do it. Stepping over that boundary every single time caused injury to my marriage. That's truth. There's no arguing that. Most women, statistically, and you can agree with me, I think, on this, won't say anything. They just do it. And resentment builds up in a relationship based on that. That resentment can build up, and it could be in several other arenas in their marriage, to the point where... It just, it makes it where the marriage is unreparable and she just drops and she's, I'm out, I'm done. And there's no reconciliation. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Why are you going? What happened? And she says, you don't even understand. And she's gone. If you do that for too long, yeah, you'll create that. What, what does testosterone do in this case? Why am I bringing up testosterone? When you give a woman normal levels of testosterone, when you normalize her testosterone, the amygdala, the tone comes up a little bit. Her feelings of confidence, assertiveness, uh, fearlessness, as I mentioned, are higher. But not just that, but boundary setting is better too. And, and she feels more inclined to say, this is my boundary. So when you normalize a woman's testosterone and she's been going through that cycle of him not doing the dishes or the coffee table or, or the laundry or whatever it is, it's going to be abrupt to say, stop it. Hey, this is wrong. And you'll find them having an immediate response like that. 
that happens. And I always counsel my patients, be aware, you know, that you'll be more confident, more assertive. If there's unresolved things in your life, just be aware of these things. These are important because you'll be speaking your mind a little bit more than you were before. And, and it's hard for people to conceive of that until they do it. And then like, oh yeah, I noticed that. I'm actually more, you know, I stand up for myself more, more easily. Does that mean she's a monster when her testosterone is normal and she says, hey, that's you with the dishes. It's been going on for years. You got to stop it. Does that make her a monster or a bad guy? Is this testosterone that caused this? No, it was me not doing my dishes for a long time. That's what caused it. And then if her amygdala, she had low tone of testosterone, she was not communicating as clearly because she didn't have that confidence. Those things in her brain chemistry was off. That happens too. That's a part of it as well. And then normalizing that, of course, she's going to initiate more. Do I get mad at her for bringing it up that way and being mad at me? No, that's not, that's not the problem. The problem was that I was not doing my part. So when a patient, when you give a woman testosterone and, you know, she goes and she starts standing up for herself, that's not the problem of the hormone. That's the problem of the pathology that's going on in the background. That's what that is. That's where that came from. Always. Wait, always is not the right word. <laughs> Hold on. Don't use always because there's more. Hold on. <laughs> so, so am I always right? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. You guys, if you always think, if you, you know, there's some, some of these people out here that talk and they're like, I'm always right. And they always present themselves. That may not, they may not say they're always right, but you know how they present. They're like, I'm the best. I know everything. Let me tell you something. I will never do that. And if I do, Justin will take me down a notch or someone will. I promise you, I, I will never be that guy. But I want you to know, I know I'm not always right. Okay. I know that. So when would this happen? When would testosterone cause her to become more angry? Well, again, Studies show women with normal physiological levels. Studies show that people with normal levels of testosterone don't get rage filled. Studies show that people with high levels of testosterone do not get rage filled. And that's in the studies below, I'll, I'll cite that. Why is there an anger issue associated with testosterone? It's not the testosterone. You see, testosterone goes to the amygdala and it stimulates that part of the brain to become active. And that's like that animal brain. But those impulses from the amygdala must get through the frontal cortex before you express them. So to pass through that frontal cortex, what happens? It gets buffered. We become, we say, okay, this is the impulse. Let me, what's a socially appropriate way to express it? How can I communicate in a socially appropriate way? And you have the whole frontal cortex that you were raised with, that you developed by being raised, to, to help you buffer how you respond from the amygdala stimuli. There are times when there's damage to the frontal cortex. Some people have issues with the frontal cortex, um, trauma, drug abuse. Um, these things can affect how the frontal cortex receives impulse from the amygdala. True. So those times people with testosterone, the testosterone levels are normal, but man, they're like, bah, you know, you need to lower the testosterone levels and figure out what's going on with the frontal cortex other things in the frontal cortex that could be at play. When you have low cortisol and low serotonin, normal amygdala stimuli from the amygdala to the frontal cortex doesn't get buffered and you'll have the more impulse without that buffering from that frontal cortex. So if someone has chronically low cortisol, where does that come from? Chronic stress, running your engine hard, not sleeping enough. Those people are always irritable to begin with. That's why they don't have a frontal cortex that's active that's able to buffer the amygdala pushing forward. And they don't need more testosterone to become irritable. They're just irritable. Testosterone on that, gas on a fire. You need to screen your patients for cortisol. Other things, low serotonin. Low serotonin and low cortisol definitely do play a role. So if someone has low serotonin, low cortisol, normal testosterone, they're not gonna react well. They'd be more irritable. So that is something that needs to be screened for and monitored on the part of the doctor. And then as I mentioned, I am always ready to be wrong. That's why we run lab work regularly. That's why I listen to my patients. That's why I adjust their dose, always. And we have good communication back and forth to understand what's happening. I hope that helped. And I hope that helps you with uh, the idea of whether testosterone causes irritability to be excessive in women or not. We are here to be of service. Justin and I were just talking about this earlier before this episode. We are here to be of service. We both love this part of our work. Um, 
I really do. And so your comments mean a lot to us and we use your comments to help guide future episodes. So please feel free to add something below. If you think I missed something regarding this or you think that you'd like to hear more about it or something else along these lines, just write in the comments, either on the YouTube channel uh, or on Instagram, TikTok, whatever you're seeing this on, we'll get to it, right? So thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.